Harvard Divinity School. Univitalism and American Law, February 18th, 2022. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I know there are still participants joining us, uh, but I want to begin because we have a very rich conversation to be had and we want to grab every minute of it that we're able to do. And I am here just to begin our conversation this morning, our webinar, to, by welcoming you to Univitalism and American Law. I'm Diane Moore. I'm Director of Religion and Public Life at Harvard Divinity School and Lecturer on Religion, Conflict, and Peace. We at Religion and Public Life are co-sponsoring this webinar with the Office of Academic Affairs. In a moment, I'll introduce my colleague, Janet Giazzo, who will moderate this webinar and introduce our featured speakers, Stephen Coe, and our respondents, Charles Hallisey and David Holland. Following introductions, Professor Coe will present his remarks followed by responses from Professors Hollisey and, Ho and Holland and some discussion among the three of them. It's now my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Janet Giazzo, Hershey Professor of Buddhist Studies and Associate Dean for Faculty and Academic Affairs here at HDS. She's a specialist in Buddhist studies with concentration on Tibetan and South Asian cultural and intellectual history, and the author of several books and articles, far too numerous to mention here in this brief introduction. Her current writing concerns the phenomenology of living well with animals and related ethical issues and practices. In 2018, Professor Gyatso was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Science in both teaching and writing, she draws on cultural and literary theory and endeavors to widen the spectrum of intellectual resources for the understanding of Buddhist and Tibetan history. I'll turn it over to you now, Janet, and look forward to this rich conversation this morning. Thank you so much, Diane, my good friend, and welcome everybody. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation a really unusual conversation um, cross-disciplinary between uh, law and religion does not happen very often. And I'm really excited to hear Professor Ko's presentation and the responses of our two uh, respondents. And hopefully we will have time for a few questions and answers uh, at the end of those presentations. Now, I just want to say to everyone um, that uh, even though we um, got ourselves ready and we all met, the presenters uh, came in um, 10 minutes before to make sure everything was okay. I just have had a glitch in my, on my computer that I closed my Outlook where I had all the notes for, the, um, for my introduction of our three speakers. And unfortunately, my computer is not allowing me to open uh, those notes at the moment. So hopefully they will come up very soon and I will be able to introduce all three of our speakers a little bit later. But let's start first with Stephen Coe. He is a professor of law at, at Boston College and we're very happy to hear from him. And um, uh, apologies again for uh, my badly acting computer. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Janet. <clears throat> thank you so much for the introductions and uh, thank you all for attending. Today, I'm just going to share my screen to uh, bring up my PowerPoint. Uh, the title of my presentation this morning is Univitalism in American Law. Uh, but before I get into the substance, I'd like to say a word of thanks uh, to the Harvard Divinity School Religion and Public Life Program. And additionally, uh, in particular to Professor Diane Moore first. Uh, Professor Moore and I have known each other, I think since 1996 when she was a faculty member at Phillips Academy and over my high school. Uh, even back when I was a high schooler, I and the other students on campus knew that Professor Moore was perhaps the most scholarly of all the faculty members at uh, Phillips Academy. And it's really a pleasure and honor for me to reconnect with Professor Moore uh, in this capacity all these years later uh, in this academic context. Additionally to Professor Giazzo, uh, who I had the pleasure of meeting over the summer and who generously offered me an opportunity to present my research in this interdisciplinary context, I'm very grateful uh, to Professor Gyatso as well. And of course, to Charlie Halsey and David Holland, thank you so much uh, for, for your time and in advance for your consideration and, and for your comments. 
Our founding American legal document, uh, the Declaration of Independence states that it's self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with inalienable rights. It's well discussed and undisputed in American legal scholarship that the foundations of our American legal system are Judeo-Christian. Uh, notions such as inalienable rights, notions such as in God we trust are baked into the very fabric of our society and therefore into our legal system. In our popular culture, we have debates increasingly around the sacred versus the secular. Uh, Christopher Hitchens and Tony Blair being exemplars of this in our public discourse. One advocates uh, for, uh, in the case of Prime Minister Blair, Catholic conception of life, or as someone such as the late Christopher Hitchens argues for an atheist conception of life. But one space in which they, they agree is that we have one life to live. Uh, that is a foundational belief in the Catholic tradition. And for many atheists, uh, humanists, and or agnostics, though not all, uh, they also share that belief. By contrast, other, uh, other religious systems uh, in the East, but increasingly a, a plurality of Americans, believe that we have many lives to live with an increasing belief in rebirth and reincarnation here in the United States, for example. So today's topic is uh, explores this question of the belief that we only live once in contrast to the belief that we live many times. Uh, I've created a word for this univitalism, the belief that human beings only live once. And the question that I ask is what is the function of univitalism in American law and culture? Uh, more specifically today, what I'd like to do is first provide a little bit of an orientation, uh, given that this is an interdisciplinary talk for a divinity school audience about the nature of my legal research at the intersection of law and culture. Uh, then I'd like to go a little bit deeper into my definition of univitalism and compare it to what I call multivitalism. And finally, explore that the central question is, again, which is how does univitalism function in American law and culture? Uh, two preliminary notes before I do so. The first is that uh, I am, of course, exploring the religious and cultural conceptual space animating law, uh, as opposed to litigating the truth of one religion or another. Perhaps that's self-evident for a divinity school audience in these sorts of discussions, but I wanted to make that clear at the outset. The other thing is that I am a law scholar exploring this intersection, and thus uh, I'm very conscious of the fact that I am not nearly as sophisticated as my commentators or many of others of you in the room who are much more fluent in talking about the intersection uh, between religious thought, metaphysical truth claims, uh, and their broader influence on law and society. So I'm very much deferential to uh, the commentators and to all of you here today, and I ask for your forgiveness if I, if I overstate or flatten uh, too much a lot of the subtlety uh, in this space. Okay, so let's start with some orientation for a divinity school audience. Uh, what does it mean to uh, do research in law and culture? And how might we think about uh, framing this overarching question of univitalism in American law? Well, I, I think for a lot of non-law professors and non-lawyers, uh, our legal institutions uh, to some degree are self-evident to us. We're conscious of the fact that we operate in our daily lives within a system of laws. We have employment contracts. Uh, we, we operate, we click on user agreements when we sign up for uh, new activities online. And occasionally our legal institutions make the headlines which trigger some reflection. We're having a discussion right now, for example, on Justice Breyer's retirement and who President Biden may choose to be his successor on the Supreme Court. But the starting principle I'd like to begin with today is this concept of territoriality. Territoriality is the proposition that each country in the world has its own distinct legal system. And that legal system uh, has a whole authority uh, uh, within that territorial space. This is something that's probably intuitive to many of us, but what may be less intuitive to, to some of us, uh, again, coming from a non-legal background, while we spend most of our time thinking about the governmental structure uh, uh, under which we are governed in the legislative, executive, and judicial branches, the US Constitution is the founding document that uh, allocates and delegates authority between the branches. And of course, uh, bodies such as the judiciary and the legislature uh, help to articulate the laws in our contemporary society. And in some, many cases, including in the judiciary, they will interpret these laws with a tremendous amount of granularity. But if we zoom out for a moment and look globally, uh, the United States is just one of 193 distinct national and or territorial legal systems. Each country has its own system of laws, 
that govern within its territory, and its jurisdiction is therefore confined to that particular space. My central identity as a scholar and my central research question is, what happens when national systems interact? In other words, if each legal system to some degree is independent from uh, another, but increasingly in a globalized world, there are uh, causes by which countries are interacting uh, through commerce, trade, uh, through criminal justice. How is it that these systems harmonize or fail to harmonize uh, when interacting with, with each other? This flows uh, to some degree from my professional background. I work for the uh, International Criminal Court and for the United Nations uh, for multiple international courts in The Hague. These are sui generis uh, international courts that do not belong to any individual national jurisdiction. Uh, and I also, after that, worked for the US Department of Justice, focusing on cross-border questions of criminal justice. Uh, in that way, I became much more familiar between these two professional experiences in how different legal systems function and the cultural assumptions upon which those systems function. Now, as a, a full-time uh, law professor, I focus at the intersection of, of these questions. So first, international law. As I already mentioned, I worked for certain courts uh, that have global reach. The ultimate example of this in law in, in the kind of first mover in the space that I study in international criminal law is Nuremberg. The central question at the end of World War II is what should the allies do with Nazi uh, Germans? Uh, Stalin's view is that we should summarily execute them all. But uh, the United States and the United Kingdom said, we should have international courts to prosecute these individuals for violations of international law. That's what created the kind of first mover in my space, which was international cr criminal tribunals. These tribunals do not belong to any territorial jurisdiction. They are trying to harmonize between different legal systems to prosecute people for universal crimes. The other area of research that uh, I focus on is called transnational law. And that's different from international law because it's not a international body sitting above all different countries. It focuses on the state to state relationships. Uh, that was the work I did uh, at the Department of Justice. And the, the kind of classic example of, of such cases in the, in the work that I did in my former office, and now that I write about in my scholarship, is extraditions. For example, the El Chapo extradition. Uh, this was a case of a Mexican national, uh, the head of the Sinaloa drug cartel, who committed criminal offenses in the United States and in Mexico. As is well known, the Mexican uh, government had trouble uh, uh, incarcerating him. He escaped from prison multiple times. And as a result, he was extradited to the United States. So I focus on the process by which countries interact. How is it that El Chapo, a Mexican citizen, is able to be uh, moved by uh, law enforcement uh, from Mexico to the United States? That's a question of interaction of distinct national legal systems. So my methodology is to be legally institutionally oriented, but I also have a background in cultural psychology and philosophy uh, from studies at Cambridge that I did before going to uh, law school. Um, as a result, I'm very interested in questions of epistemology, for example. And when it comes to overlaying some of those questions onto questions of law, I'm very intrigued by different conceptualizations of the relationship between law and culture. A well-known uh, law review article uh, talks about three different approaches. One is that culture creates law. This is an old uh, German idea. There's a certain set of cultural norms and then they are codified in our legal system. The second one is that law creates culture. Uh, in other words, uh, once new legal uh, concepts are introduced by the legislature, that shapes our cultural norms. And the third one is law as a distinct cultural system. For me, the, the kind of dominant uh, uh, posture by which I'm approaching this particular project is to think of law and culture in kind of three steps. One is certain cultural values and norms exist in a given society. At some point, those norms are reified in law through legal codification. And then these laws uh, are reinforced and continuously reconstruct our collective cultural conceptions. Uh, another way of putting this more colloquially is certain truth claims are uploaded into our legal system at a certain point and then continuously downloaded as the laws are enforced and interpreted uh, by our executive and uh, uh, judicial branches. What are some examples of this? Well, one is what uh, some of us know as stand your ground laws. Uh, the Kyle Rittenhouse case was an example uh, of this. 
there is a concept in law of self-defense. If someone approaches me using deadly force, for example, approaches me with a gun, I may use my gun lawfully in self-defense. In many jurisdictions, for example, in Massachusetts, there's also a duty to retreat. Uh, if, I, if someone's coming at me with a gun, but I have the possibility of entering my home safely, I have a legal duty to do so. But in many other parts of the country, there is no such duty, right? In fact, in the, in the majority of the country, there's no such duty. To some degree, that reflects something about the culture. For example, in Texas, there's a culture of, if someone approaches me, I'm going to stand my ground. I'm not going to back down. This is a more rugged, uh, individualist uh, conception. Right. Another example of law and culture uh, playing out in real time right now is the question of um, cannabis legality. We see differences in cultural perceptions of uh, uh, marijuana use in our laws through referenda, through legislative action. Uh, another example of this could be, for example, attitudes towards gay marriage driving some of the judicial conceptions of gay marriage uh, up until the Supreme Court ruled on this question, ultimately in Obergefell. So again, all of this goes to the overarching questions of what happens when national systems interact and what is the relation between national cultures, national legal systems, and the harmonization between national cultures and national legal systems over time. A final uh, piece to this to be a little bit more personal uh, is I am actually ethnically half Korean and half Lebanese, uh, though I was born in the United States and my, my parents were born in the United States. And I've realized that on some level, um, a lot of my research focus is rooted in the fact that I grew up in a multicultural and multiracial home. I think consciously or subconsciously, I've spent some percentage of my life thinking about my different backgrounds, different uh, cultural belief systems and how they may harmonize within me uh, and within my family. More specifically on a religious level, I was uh, born in the Melkite Catholic tradition, the Eastern Catholic tradition, but I also have Buddhist family uh, in Korea. And uh, given my studies in Cambridge when I was studying uh, philosophy and psychology, I also spent uh, time in a variety of Arab and Muslim countries where I really became exposed to uh, and intrigued by other Abrahamic uh, traditions. So a kind of example of how this personal background plays out uh, for me is to ask, for example, in a previous piece of scholarship, how is it that the United States and other legal systems should harmonize their conceptions of rights? We take it as natural in this country that we have a right to trial by jury, for example. But other countries, for example, Germany, do not have a right to trial by jury. So where is the line that we draw with regard to whether or not another legal system has a su sufficient number of rights? We do not extradite US nationals to China to be prosecuted because we think their judicial system does not have a sufficient amount of rights but we extradite to Germany, even though they lack one of our fundamental rights. This is why I've introduced this concept of core criminal procedure. Uh, and again, I think this kind of plays into my background. You know, when these different systems interact, what is the core uh, that we can all uh, agree upon for purposes of working forward? Okay. Okay, let me move on now to, to talk more about the subject at hand, which is univitalism. So, Again, I define univitalism in the paper as the belief that human beings only live once, uh, taking uh, the kind of Latin terms uni and vita. Univitalism is uh, the norm, broadly speaking, in Abrahamic religions. I know there are exceptions to that. For example, the Sufi Islamic tradition, uh, some branches of that have a multivitalist conception. But I think it's fair to say at a high level of generality, there is a belief that we only live once uh, in the Abrahamic traditions. Again, in our secular tradition, we also have uh, this, this belief. Uh, some people, some agnostics would say they are agnostic as to this question, but many times just in our popular culture, the secular tradition would say uh, our safe assumption is that we only live once. Uh, and this is also something that uh, arises not just in our legal system or in our religious traditions, but also in our broader American or Western culture. Uh, Shakespeare uh, says that our life is rounded with a sleep. Uh, and for the younger members of this uh, workshop, you may know the motto by Drake is that you only live once. This has become part of our American lexicon, uh, the YOLO conception. But my goal at the outset of this presentation is to disturb our collective sense, uh, American sense of univitalism. I, I find it curious and intriguing, and my, the commentators can correct me if I'm wrong, that we don't have a word in the English language for the belief that we only live once. Uh, I analogize this to the fish in the water who's not conscious of the fact 
that it is in water. But if we compare our univitalist uh, law and society conception to a multivitalist conception, it may help us to see how this is a cultural assumption upon which we're operating, and therefore a legal assumption upon which we may be operating. So how might we uh, compare to other systems in order to disturb our collective sense of, of American univitalism and, and expose it as an, a metaphysical assumption that we make in American law and culture? Well, one way to do so is to look uh, east. Uh, as I mentioned in my paper, the best example uh, known in, in America anyway, I think it's safe to say, Professor Gyatso can correct me if I'm wrong, is the Dalai Lama, who's referred to as the 14th Dalai Lama. Because in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, and in most branches of the, of the Buddhist tradition, uh, uh, according to the Dharma, uh, individuals are reborn. Uh, and there's very fascinating and graphic detail about how Tibetan Buddhist monks find the new Dalai Lama after each one has passed away. They use a variety of um, signs that they derive from dreams, from the, the body uh, position of the previous Dalai Lama, sometimes statements of the previous Dalai Lama. And they use that as the foundation to look for the child who has memories of the Dalai Lama's uh, past life. And this is not just uh, the case for uh, the Dalai Lama, this also applies to a variety of other uh, Buddhist monks. Uh, this is not just an Eastern conception, however, there is increasingly a view uh, in the West that we live more than once. This has appeared in our philosophy. For example, Nietzsche has brought up this idea of infinite return as a foundation for his moral philosophy to drive what our human actions should be. And increasingly, according to Pew, there is a plurality of Americans who believe uh, that we, uh, we return. You can see here, amongst all uh, US American adults, 33%, at least in 2017, uh, believe in reincarnation. The final kind of uh, example of a kind of multivitalist conception, which is actually the research that sparked my initial interest in this area, uh, was research at the University of Virginia Medical School that's found over 2,500 cases of children with granular memories of past lives. Some of this research is so intriguing because these children who are extremely young report a tremendous amount of detail about events that happened before they were born. Uh, for example, one young child reported um, uh, the name, it reported being in the Battle of Iwo Jima. He recognized the island. He named the name of the uh, battleship he was on. He named uh, the name of another fighter pilot who was on the battleship. Subsequently, the, the parents uh, went on Wikipedia, did more investigation, and, and found that all of those facts were true. Uh, now, I'm not a medical uh, professor, and I, I can't vouch for the uh, the quality of this research, but I think it is intriguing that, that there is at least a little bit of scientific research in this space, again, just to disturb our assumption that we do only live once. And one other anecdote, uh, which may be particularly interested to uh, Professor Halsey, is I became so interested in this research at University of Virginia, I sent uh, the book, which just came out last year, uh, summarizing much of this research to one of my uh, dear friends, a very distinguished Sri Lankan uh, international lawyer. And uh, during COVID, I had trouble getting the book to him. So I shipped it through Amazon and it arrived at his mother's house. Uh, both he and his mother are very observant Sri Lankan Buddhists. And she started reading through the book and reading all the research of these 2,500 cases, which again has a lot of granular detail, including you know, the median amount of time uh, that, that uh, children report that they, the median amount of time between the, the, the death of the previous uh, personality and the birth of the new child, et cetera, et cetera. And the mother of my uh, friend read it through as a Sri Lankan Buddhist and just shrugged her shoulders and said, this is completely old news to me. I don't see anything new in this medical research. This is what Buddhists have been saying for a long time. Um, in a way, there may be a rough analogy here to concepts like yoga or meditation. These are old traditions that have existed to some degree in the West, but obviously have been imported from uh, the Eastern traditions in recent years, they have always existed and they have always uh, had proven medical benefits that is now uh, confirmed by Western research. But it's only now that we are kind of awakening to this uh, Eastern, uh, the, the kind of truth of some of these Eastern uh, conceptions. Perhaps that is something that could emerge in the future with multivitalism. But again, the point of this is not to kind of, is not to litigate whether or not multivitalism or, or 
multivitalism or univitalism is true. The point of this is to understand that univitalism is a belief that we have in our society that then is reified and uh, implemented in American law and culture, right? Returning to this law and culture relationship. So how exactly does this play out in American law? For the re remainder of my time, and I believe I have about nine minutes left, uh, I'll explore this in greater depth in American law. As I mentioned already, our American legal tradition comes from the Catholic canon law originally, and then from English common law. All of our, uh, the kind of core of our common law system, as we call it in the United States, was imported from the United Kingdom and has continued to proliferate since that time. What are some examples of Judeo-Christian uh, ideas and concepts that are in our law? So as uh, uh, Blackstone, who's one of the most famous jurists uh, in the Anglo-American tradition, talks about how the law was imparted by God himself. As I already mentioned, the Declaration of Independence talks about self-evident truths uh, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And our uh, Constitution talks about other rights that, uh, that are provided for, even those that are not codified within the Constitution itself. This is a Madisonian idea, uh, the, ninth, the Ninth Amendment to the Bill of Rights, talking about how there are other rights that are inalienable to us that we possess that the state may not infringe. But that's, again, a very established way of thinking about American law. We can shift the legal analysis to focus on a univitalist conception, and that may give us new insights about the function of our legal system and the function of this belief in our culture and society. The first example that I've found in my research is witness oaths. So it is uh, well known to most of us, I think in, in the United States, that uh, if one of us is to take the stand, we will swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help us God. But in the Cambodian uh, International Court, which is jointly administered by the international community, the oath that witnesses need to take in Cambodia a pledges that they will tell the truth, and if they do not, there will be uh, uh, undesirable implications for those individuals, their loved ones and family members in future reincarnations for 500 reincarnations. What is the function of univitalism here? From a Cambodian perspective, again, from a broad perspective, if there's a sincere belief that individuals are reborn uh, infinitely forward, then if a witness is to lie on the stand in a particular case, well, that's just one of many lives and uh, maybe the stakes are a little bit lower. But taking an oath for 500 reincarnations puts skin in the game for these witnesses. In other words, the legal system tailors the oath to the religious and cultural assumptions and the multivitalist uh, assumptions in that particular space. Another example of this is the idea of judicial notice. This is an evidentiary conception uh, in American evidence. Judicial notice is when a court accepts as evidence of fact that it perceives to be self-evidently true. So for example, a court could state, it hereby takes judicial notice of the fact that Harvard Divinity School is in Cambridge, Massachusetts. This is so obvious that it does not need to be litigated by the parties. What's intriguing is that courts have taken judicial notice of the fact that we have one life to live. It's so evident, it is so not subject to reasonable dispute that courts assume this in certain circumstances. There's also some, so, so where, where do we take this? What is the function uh, that this is playing? Well. Uh, Michelle Alexander, who's very well known uh, in, in law circles, but is also a public intellectual, is known more broadly for having written The New Jim Crow, uh, advanced this question in, a, in an op-ed in the New York Times asking, what if we're all coming back? She used the concept of rebirth to ask the question, perhaps if we had a multivitalist conception moving forward, we would have a different posture towards environmental law and policy we would not be as flippant in, in disregarding some of the uh, environmental degradation if we sincerely believed we were all uh, to return. What about in criminal law? Well, there per perhaps could be two different ways in which univitalism could uh, influence the development of criminal law and criminal sentencing, for example. Uh, sentencing being uh, uh, decisions that courts make as to how long someone should serve time in prison. One is the nature of ur urgency. Perhaps there is a greater urgency to pu punish criminals for wrongdoing in this life if we believe they only have one life to live. This is a Kantian conception around the idea of moral desert. 
There's also potentially a question of, of self-interest when it comes to environmental laws or tax policy. Uh, this idea of the Rawlsian veil of ignorance, when we don't know what space we will have uh, in society. Well, if we have a sense of infinite return, maybe this will affect uh, the way we think about, for example, distributional questions. It could also affect the way we think about criminal laws, who is punished when and for what uh, conduct. So just a, a few uh, final thoughts before I conclude. Uh, what might apprehending this function of univitalism and its influence in American law look like? Well, one is to say that even though we can have a conception of law and culture that uh, is, is rooted in our Judeo-Christian foundations or in our univitalist foundations, there are examples in our legal system of, of our judiciary moving away from certain religious conceptions. So Stone v. Graham, which is a very well-known US Supreme Court case, ruled that the Ten Commandments could not be posted in certain governmental spaces because it had within it too religious of a conception uh, uh, that, were, that should not be imposed in a public space, right? violated the conception of a church and, uh, separation of church and state as codified, uh, well, as not explicitly codified, but as codified in the Establishment Clause uh, of the First Amendment. Uh, Congress shall make no law establishing a, a state religion. And again, more broadly, we could also have in our American culture, uh, a, a recontextualization around an awareness of univitalism as a cultural assumption. Again, in the same way that uh, yoga or meditation have kind of disturbed our kind of lay conceptions of what it means to reflect, for example, or what it means to be physically fit. Perhaps a, a more uh, self-conscious univitalist uh, awareness might reconceptualize the way that we think about uh, um, uh, life, both in American law and, and, and American culture. So in conclusion, it is a confounding assumption in our legal system that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator in, by inalienable rights. This is based on our Jude Judeo-Christian legal foundations, but that Judeo-Christian conception overlooks the fact that there is a shared assumption by both the sacred, sac people with sacred and secular views that we only live once and that is heightened as an assumption when we compare it to multivitalist conceptions. My uh, view is that the function of univitalism in American law and culture from a law and culture uh, methodology has an implications for environmental tax and criminal law around variables that may include urgency and self-interest. And finally, by way of conclusion, some questions um, for, for Divinity School audience for which I'd be very grateful to you all, given that this is an interdisciplinary environment and it is not, again, the kind of typical uh, space in which I present is, have I accurately captured the broad metaphysical distinctions between the Abrahamic religions and certain Eastern traditions? How do contemporary religion scholars theorize the relationship between religious notions of life and culture? And finally, how might scholarly attention to univitalism help understanding of other contemporary issues in American society other than law? Thank you all for your attention. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Professor Koh, that was great and um, really lucid and thought provoking. And um, I, as a scholar of and teacher of Buddhist studies, am so glad that you're raising these alternate views of our very life um, and death uh, and their implications for really big issues. Um, so that's really fantastic. I have managed to recover uh, my notes on introducing our speakers. So I can now in retrospect, just let you know a little bit more about Professor Koh that you, whom you just heard from. He is the inaugural Marion D. Short and Ray Scora uh, sesquintential assistant professor at Boston, Law, uh, Boston College Law School. And he is a former trial attorney in the US Department of the Justice's Criminal Division. Uh, U.S. federal and state prosecutors on international criminal and constitutional legal issues arising in United States criminal cases with transnational dimensions, as he talked about in his talk, and his um, international legal experience spans multiple continents, uh, highlighted by positions in two prominent international criminal courts in The Hague, the Netherlands. You actually did hear all of that from him previously, but now we're going to hear uh, two, respons uh, two responses both of them from faculty at Harvard Divinity School. And the first person we will hear from is Charles Hallisey. He joined the Faculty of Divinity in 2007 after teaching at the University of Wisconsin as Associate 
professor in the Department of Languages and Cultures of Asia and the Religious Studies Program since 2001. Uh, Professor Halsey's research centers on Theravada Buddhism in Sri Lanka and in Southeast Asia, in Pali language and literature, Buddhist ethics, and literature in Buddhist culture. His most recent book is a Terigata, Poems of the First Buddhist Women that was published by Harvard University Press in 2015. And let me just introduce you now briefly to Professor Holland, who will be speaking Next, uh, Professor Holland joined the HDS faculty in 2013. His research casts a broad and inclusive net in understanding the deep intellectual, theological, and cultural cu currents driving New England church history. He's the author of numerous uh, book reviews and journal articles and review essays, including from Ann Hutchinson to Horace Bushnell, a new take on the New England sequence and a mixed construction of subversion and conversion, the complicated lives and times of religious women. So they'll be speaking from two somewhat different perspectives and let me ask uh, Professor Hallisey first to speak. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Gatzo, and thank you especially Professor Koh for a very original and stimulating discussion. Uh, I was just introduced as you know, someone whose research and interests lie in the study of the Buddhist world, but my comments and reacting to Professor Koh's paper uh, will begin with uh, my interest as someone who has a union card in the academic study of religion, and me personally having a longstanding interest in how law thinks about religion. One of the interesting things for all of us, I think, in the academic study of religion is for us to acknowledge that within the, the field of law, the academic study of law, we have a sibling who is uh, equally uh, thoughtful, equally self-reflective, uh, equally uh, adventuresome in conceptualizing what uh, religion is as a human phenomenon. They just go about it in radically uh, different ways. And that they, some of the ways that they go about it are often quite incompatible with the ways that uh, those of us in the academic study of religion have come to function. Let me explain this with uh, my own understanding of it and my own interest in it. Because of the First Amendment of the United States Constitution, which prohibits the, the state to interfere with the free exercise of religion, what is a, a legitimate uh, interference with the free exercise of religion depends on certain concepts of what is essential to religious practice. So one of the th interesting things to me for the legal study of religion is it, the centrality of issues about practice, whereas in the academic study of religion, the centrality often is about ideas. And then also something that is uh, We'll focus on what is essential to the practices of a religious community. Whereas in the academic study of religion, we are deeply committed anti-essentialists. To call someone else an essentialist is to invite them outside for a fistfight. The other thing that happens in the, the academic study of religion quite often is that there's a commitment to what I will refer to as holism that any individual idea cannot be understood independently of its connection to uh, you know, other practices, other ideas, other experiences, other institutions in, within a given religious culture. Whereas it strikes me that in the uh, legal study of religion, there is an indifference to issues about holism, if not uh, an uh, antagonism to ideas about holism. So one of the interesting things for me about Professor Koh's paper is that he doesn't begin with practice, but he begins with an idea of something about uni what he's calling univitalism versus multivitalism. But the ideas of uh, 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 essentialism, uh, anti-holism seem to still be functioning in terms of uh, lifting out one, uh, one idea from larger wholes of religious life. What he ends up with uh, in terms of coining an uh, interpretive category like univitalism or uh, multivitalism strikes me like the kinds of categories that have circulated in uh, the academic study of religion, things like animist or things like primitive religion. Uh, it's part of our legacy that right now, given our uh, kind of 
changing self-consciousness, we often struggle against. The other category that's at play that I want to come back to later is Abrahamic, uh, uh, is another kind of category that is somehow grouping together uh, different uh, religions based on some essential feature that they share together, in this case, uni univitalism. Now, Part of, I want to just confess uh, my complete ignorance of anything about legal scholarship and its conventions and genres. So reading Professor Koh's paper, listening to his presentation, I have an immediate thoughts so of what is this? What's the genre? I feel like the uh, 20th century Indian poet Tagore when he went to Indonesia and he said, everywhere I see India, but I don't recognize it. So, Everywhere I see things that I know about, but I just not sure I recognize it. So the question, both reading the paper and listening to Professor Ko this morning is, is this a thought experiment of some sort that where you say, oh, that to bring utility and vigor to American law through a thought experiment? I'm very sympathetic to thought experiments. Uh, I'd like to do them myself. Someone uh, sent me an email a while ago in which said, I saw a bumper sticker that said, uh, I don't believe everything I think. And for some reason, I thought of you. And so the, in that, I just say, oh, the thought experiments don't uh, require belief. They are just exploring possibilities. Other times, particularly this morning, where Professor Cole was giving background to his research, it seems that maybe the purpose here is for uh, thinking about multivitalism, univitalism, is to give, uh, help to give a more adequate account of the role of law and religion in American law for the sake of creating a future that will have a better way of accounting for the presence of multivitalist ideas, uh, uh, assumptions in, in American society. The third, where he said that sometimes in terms of legal scholarship, that law can come is, is something that is able to create better cultures. And so whether the, the, what uh, uh, Professor Coe is doing is for the sake of a better future, a better American culture that is able to grapple with the diversity of ideas that it, at this point it is not able to do. Now, the, that latter issue, made me think of the difference between how religion and the state function in the United States versus in the Constitution of India, where the Constitution of the United States asks that uh, the state not interfere with uh, any religious practice, not establish any particular religion. Whereas in the Indian Constitution, the state is uh, charged with supporting all religious practices equally. And so it's not being indifferent to religious practices, but promoting them. And whether, the, I just had a question, whether uh, the, the horizon that this paper moves towards is actually a shift to an idea of uh, secularism as it is in the Indian constitution versus secularism as it is in the American constitution. Let me just move then to issues about the, the core of the presentation, uh, multivitalism and univitalism. I want to just raise up a really magnificent uh, thought experiment by the uh, Sri Lankan anthropologist and Buddhist intellectual Gan Gananat Obiasekara that's called Imagining Karma, which begins with the issue of multivitalism and uh, multiple lives in multiple cultures, including Northwest American uh, Indians, uh, 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 ancient Greek thought, uh, all kinds of places. And then he moves to, as a Buddhist intellectual, to the distinctiveness of Buddhist ideas of multivitalism in which he says that it is ethicized that it is not just that people have multiple lives, beings have multiple lives, but those multiple lives are structured by the afterlife of their actions. The op-ed piece by Michelle Alexander ignores that uh, ethicization. It's just a random chance of where will you be reborn? Uh, and it's more given the, the, the demographic distributions of social inequalities, uh, a white, uh, 
North American male, like myself, is more likely to be reborn as a non-white female that is struggling under social inequality. So one of the things that happens is, what happens when we take out the idea of multivitalism away from ideas that you have in both Hinduism and Buddhism or the ethicization of multivitalism within the ideas of karma? The other thing that I would say is really quite interesting in terms of you know, social sciences are two questions that Professor Cole puts out. One is, does religion make a person more pro-social? Uh, that then the, the, Michelle Alexander raised this, does multivitalism make an individual more compassionate? As someone who spent a long time in Sri Lanka, I'm doubtful of that. In the 1950s, Sri Lanka with a multivitalist majority population, your friend's mother who has said, oh, this is old news about multivitalism. In the 1950s, before the civil war, Sri Lanka had the highest per capita murder rate in the world. So the idea that somehow the assumption of multivitalism makes one more compassionate or more pro-social is something that needs to be invested, investigated in the, really something of an empirical way. Ideologically, Buddhist thinkers like to assume that it is, but uh, then you would just say, oh, this other stuff is not really connected to Buddhism. The quotes from Michelle Alexander and the recourse to the, uh, the oath taken in the, the, the courts in Cambodia made me think that the issue here is something about punishment and deterrence not really uh, something about whether uh, certain I religious ideas orient people to life in uh, ways that make them more pro-social, more compassionate. Uh, when I was a child, I remember quite often uh, swearing, saying, I, making a promise, I cross my heart, hope to die, and making a gesture. I don't think that I ever actually hope to die. But I said that all the time. So the fact that people swear in court, you know, that to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, to swear that, oh, maybe, you know, my head be split into seven pieces for 500 births, I'm not sure what that actually performs as a performative. And, uh, and the fact that we need corroborating evidence means that we don't believe people. Now, one other thing that, uh, just out of time, I wanted, uh, there's a lot of things that I could say. One, just to recommend that when we look at the legal systems in multivitalist uh, majority societies, Hindu law, Buddhist law, pre modern Buddhist law, we don't see that uh, recourse to multivitalism being legally relevant. In fact, it seems to be intentionally marginalized. Oh, let me just end with an anxiety on my part about uh, our discussion this morning. Professor Coe in his self-introduction said that his research was uh, focused on what happens when national uh, system, legal systems interact. It raised a question for me uh, about what happens when academic discussions are part of global flows and that they move from one place to another. What I am aware of is that the category of Abrahamic religion, which seems historically justified in India today, is used as a reason why Muslims, in which India is like the second or third largest Muslim society in the world, but the category of Abrahamic religions is part of the discussions of why Muslims don't belong in India they belong with those Jews and Christians, not here. And so that category that we're using for particular kinds of reasons in our discussion has another life that we are giving it. The other is about contemporary Sri Lanka. Among Venerable Galagoda Atadyanasar, a very polemical, uh, monk who was imprisoned for uh, promoting violence against Muslims. Scenes of things happening of monks lifting their robes and urinating on the walls of mosques in Sri Lanka. That's all over the BBC and other news. 
uh, that lots of the issues of the legal conceptions of law played out in Sri Lanka as the, was it so was it essential that a monk wear his robes while he's imprisoned or should he be dressed like uh, uh, other prisoners? But in all of these discussions, which are about intimidation and inciting violence against minorities, the people who are uh, defending someone like Venerable Nyanasara refer to the kind of law, the arguments about law, uh, that it is white people's law. And so the arguments that say that univitalism is connected to Christianity, to American culture, and so on, is, is I would say, very important therapeutically for our society. But it has another effect in another society. It gives a justification for why violence against minorities uh, cannot be sanctioned by law, because that law is white people's law. Uh, brought by the, the colonists. So one uh, thought I have is, if multivitalism is about the afterlives of our actions, how do we think about the afterlives of our academic discussions? So that our discussion here at Harvard Divinity School has an afterlife in the violent politics of Asia. And how do we like think about that? And one last thing that I, entranced me that I loved about the idea of introducing multivitalism into the law is in terms of the place of legal fictions. And so now that corporations are categorized with the rights of persons, it would seem that the notion of multivitalism would be a strong case against a limited liability corporation. They need to be made to pay for the after effects of their actions because they are persons. And that multivitalism for arguing against uh, the rights and the limits of the rights of corporations as per, uh, persons would strike me to have a very important legal function. But anyway, as you can see, Professor Koh, your paper has stimulated a lot of thoughts for me and I wanna thank you for them very, very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Halsey. Um... Uh, raising questions at multiple levels, including the very implications of the kind of activity that we're engaged in right now. So I wanted to give uh, Professor Ko, if you would like to take a few moments just to reflect on perhaps some of what Professor Hallisey just raised to you. There's a lot there, but please um, take your time in anything you would like to respond or say, and then we'll and then we'll listen to Professor Holland next. So thank you so much, Professor Hollisey, for your comments. Uh, this is very enlightening for me, uh, both in terms of the substance of, of how um, religious studies scholars think about uh, holistic and uh, anti-essentialist conceptions of religion, uh, the implications for our scholarly discussions about such things, and the nature of the enterprise in which I'm engaging, whether it be a thought experiment, a question of uh, establishment clause questions, uh, cross-cultural questions, cross-legal questions, and maybe the uh, even the the challenges of even categorizing religions in certain ways, and how they may lead to uh, state violence um, uh, or or non-state violence uh, by individual actors. I would say a few things. Um, the the first is I, I benefit tremendously from some of these suggestions, including some of your uh, historical viewpoints uh, and and personal experiences in Sri Lanka, uh, for example. I would say a, a, a few different things. The first one is. I think this is, yes, this is a thought experiment in the sense that in some ways my, my paper does not depend necessarily upon um, completely comprehending. Uh, so it, to, some, to some degree is a thought experiment in the sense that I do kind of self-consciously take this one piece from a different tradition, a, a piece that admittedly yeah, overlooks ideas like karma and, and broader conceptions in the Dharma in order to focus on actually on some of the very questions you're preoccupied with, which is state violence. I think in the criminal law space and in criminal law scholarship, a central question is why do we punish as much as we do? And for what conduct do we punish? And how might a different viewpoint or a different vantage point affect the way in which we might uh, have a greater conception of mercy, for example? I think your, your distinction between uh, making you know, a, a, a kind of multivitalist conception be more pro-social 
uh, versus making the state uh, perhaps engage in state violence in a different way, I think is very well taken in the sense that there's the question of human action with regard to witness oaths. And then there's also the question of how the state responds, for example, if someone were to violate that oath, what is the appropriate punishment? And those are two different strands, which I think I should very much uh, uh, disaggregate more uh, in, in the paper. Uh, as you say, yes, the question is then therefore is the question of punishment, what is punishment and what is deterrence? And how do those concepts of punishment and deterrence uh, meet in a legal system that is operating on some sort of uh, 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 foundations? I think another thing that another benefit of um, this kind of viewpoint and, and kind of talking about um, you know some of your some of your questions about uh, and this uh, this suggestion with regard to sources with regard for example imagining karma uh, American cultures ancient Greek thought uh, this idea of ethicization all these are quite intriguing because I think part of what I'm trying to do here is to say uh, we can have a very richly religious or or to some degree and maybe I'm essentializing too much to some degree uh, Judeo Christian conceptions in our American legal system that is very much underexplored. And when we do explore it, uh, perhaps there could be more pro-social ends, perhaps not. Uh, but that, that the point of the point to some degree is to, to kind of distill that individual idea. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, to thinking more about uh, how that might, that also might be uh, problematic to some degree in a kind of broader uh, understanding of the richness and, and uh, interrelationship between uh, uh, conceptual ideas. Uh, especially with regard to holism uh, in, in these traditions. Finally, with regard to some of our scholarly after effects, um, this is also something that, you know, as a third year assistant professor, I'm very much thinking about all the time is to what ends are my scholarship. And I think one of my central ends for right now is to think about how the state punishes and in an era of mass incarceration disproportionately punishes, especially people of color. And in drawing on Michelle Alexander and other scholars and looking for new ideas by which to pursue mercy, uh, I think that that is really a central animating idea of this project. It is also intriguing to hear the flip side of this, which is invoking some of these ideas may also maybe perhaps have led to violence in some other jurisdictions uh, and could even potentially lead to violence within this jurisdiction. That's something I, I'll think more about. Thank you so much for all your comments. Thank you, Professor Ko. And I'm tempted to call him Professor Halsey, but I won't. I did see him shaking his head to a lot of what you were saying, but I just want to, first of all, let uh, Professor Holland speak. We only have another half an hour and we might have further chance for re-responses after that. So Professor Holland. Thank you, Dean Gatso, and, and thank you, um, Professor Ko, for a very generative and, uh, and evocative and provocative uh, paper. And I appreciate this exchange between you and Professor Hallisey very much. Like Professor Hallisey, I actually identified uh, multiple possible purposes uh, for the paper. Uh, like Professor Hallisey, I, I identified three. Um, they're not exactly the same three he identified, but one of the, the possible purposes that we share is the thought experiment element. Uh, and so I've especially appreciated the exchange between the two of you on that point. And I'll, I'll address that in a slightly different way uh, in just a moment. Uh, let me just say at the outset that um, one of the most difficult projects I think a scholar can undertake is the quest to help us see something that we have been heretofore unable to see, even though we've been looking at it our whole lives or maybe for multiple lives. And yet that is precisely what I think you know, Professor Coe has accomplished in this article on the taken for granted dominance of univitalism in our jurisprudential culture. He's rendered the invisible visible. And I confess to be among those that had never before considered the perhaps hegemonic influence that this concept of life and death and birth has had on the structures of legal power that surround us. And once you've seen it, it can't be unseen. So uh, Professor uh, Coe has, uh, has uh, turned a light on this dominant univitalist ontology consider or ontologies, uh, considers their implications and helps us reflect on um, the ways that our civil culture uh, is attuned to univitalist assumptions and the ways implicitly how more attention to multivitalistic possibilities might alter uh, our current assumptions and practices and the structures that flow out of them. 
And I think Professor Co ultimately even takes a step beyond the specific uh, issues associated with the multivitalist, univitalist question and points out that broader exercises like this could be a source of needed infusions of fresh thinking into ossifying jurisprudential cultures and political systems that have failed to see the full range of options available for reform. As Professor Co writes near the end of his paper, might other foreign cultural ideas bring util utility and vigor to American law and policy debates? What else is waiting to be incorporated? So in a sense, as I indicated at the outset, uh, this paper makes three contributions. The first I see is diagnostic, the revelatory detection of a conceptual reality that surrounds us. The second is the thought experiment, the sort of speculative consideration of what our civic order would look like if a different ontology informed our legal and legislative approaches. And the third is the constructive call, often implicit, but in the end, it actually becomes explicit for more critical reflections on the cosmological provincialisms that have locked us into these invisible boxes of conceptual limitation. Let me say a word or two about each of these in sequence. First, the diagnostic. As I read Professor Coe's argument, I immediately thought of the other places in American law where it is coming to grips with the fact that ostensibly secular structures of the state are in fact the product, at least in part, of particular theological inheritances that in practice privilege certain worldviews above others. One of the most notable is the contention made by scholars such as Tisa Wenger and Winifred Fowler Sullivan, both of whom try to occupy this same intellectual space at the intersection of religious studies and legal studies, uh, along with others who show that the constitutional doctrines in the United States around religious liberty reflect deeply embedded notion that religious belief is more important than religious practice, and therefore to be prioritized in cases of constitutional protection. The elevation of internal conscience over outward observance has until recently long been a guiding principle of court rulings related to free exercise cases. Case in point, drawing from Wenger's research, the Pueblo of the desert Southwest struggled to get judicial recognition of sacred dance as a protectable religious act. But a dominant and hostile ju judicial tradition steeped in Protestant assumptions about religion as a matter of the heart rather than a matter of the feet simply could not or would not see that, um, that its own very interpretive orientation was in fact a theologically informed view that violated, violated the equal protection principle that it professed, creating a kind of looping cultural logic in which a legal system that absorbed certain theological presuppositions inevitably, inevitably ended up privileging those religious cultures that were the unacknowledged source of those very presuppositions. Professor Coe's work thus adds a new and I think essential, a really important and valuable layer to this growing body of diagnostic literature, much of which focuses on the explicitly religious areas of legal application. Coe's article shows us that the theological elements running through the civic order reach even deeper and farther than we have previously appreciated, intertwining with even the most foundational of conceptual principles. I would here point out that the opening in Professor Coe's talk today, uh, the point that he makes about the fact that both Christian and secularist polemicists assume univitalism, at least in the United States or in the Anglophonic world, speaks to another growing body of literature that emphasizes the continuities rather than the contrast between Christian worldviews and the secularist understandings of the modern West. The central diagnostic element of the paper, its identification of a thing that is present and powerful, has been thoroughly convincing and illuminating to me. Let me now turn to the piece that uh, I think is more complicated, the speculative thought experiment part of the paper. Throughout the essay runs a kind of implicit comparison. It's difficult to argue what univitalism has done to us unless we're arguing about what the other possibilities would have done to us. Uh, and I think that raises an interesting epistemological challenge. Throughout the essay, this sort of implicit comparison, sometimes explicit comparison, uh, causes to evaluate the relative empathy, urgency, selflessness that adhere to uni and multivitalism. Now here, Professor Coe sets out in uh, occasionally a somewhat essentialist way, two vividly drawn alternatives 
but also at times helpfully resists the temptation to flee the complexity of the comparative case. And it's actually in those moments of resistance and sort of self-restraint that I think the paper is, is most convincing. For instance, you do argue that a multivitalist foundation might increase empathy in both criminal and environmental law in the former by considering the possibility that in a future life, those who make laws and hand down judgments might themselves be the imprisoned, and in the latter by considering the inevitability that they themselves will inherit the very same world that the present generation bequeaths to for futurity. This is a generative experiment and the otherwise possibilities of different jurisprudential outcomes that Professor Coe offers in this counterfactual seem plausible. But even as he lays them out, he, he does not entirely seek to escape what you what Professor Coe calls the counterexamples, those ways in which non univitalist worldviews could undermine rehabilitative urgency or sap the energy out of social justice by positing a karmic explanation for present inequality. So I think that concession, that acknowledgement is there. And it's in that those moments of sort of um, recognition of complexity and contrast that the paper really speaks, I think, to a religious studies crowd. So the paper in part offers sort of broad brush renderings and also acknowledges the complexities that can appear at a closer look thus gifting the reader both, I think, in a legal studies context, clarity of argument and plenty of off ramps that I found out of the reductive polemicism to which a project like this might otherwise be prone. One of the contributions of the more speculative counterfactual elements of the paper is that they open up opportunities for explanation that lead beyond themselves. Indeed, even to even more fundamental considerations than the paper addresses. For instance, as I read this paper, I began to wonder about Lockean epistemology. You, you mentioned at the outset your interest in epistemological concerns and the intellectual history around it. Well, this has very interesting implications for Lockean epistemology and arguments made by scholars like Jay Flegelman and Gordon Wood that Locke's tabula rasa conception of how humans learn, his belief borrowed in some ways from an Aristotelian tradition, that we are all born as blank slates, became so crucial to Western conceptions of human equality upon which the whole American experiment professed to rest. John Locke um, actually played around with conceptions of um, reincarnation. It does come up uh, in his work on human understanding uh, and, uh, and on um, natural rights. Um, so it was not a complete, multivitalism was not a completely foreign concept to Locke, but his central epistemological commitment to the tabula rasa suggested that even if the soul transmigrated, each newly born person represented a discontinuity of identity and therefore a unique person. So that his tabula rasa epistemological conception is closely connected to a kind of practical univitalism. So your paper, raises this question that if Locke had instead believed that rather than being born as utterly new creatures, untethered from past lives, we were born instead carrying the consequences of infinite experiences before us, would he have developed a different kind of epistemology with different sorts of political implications, thus altering history in ways even more radically than your paper suggests? It's a sign of a good argument, I think that it leaves us grappling with the questions it raises and that it lets those questions lead us into fascinating places that even the paper itself has not yet considered. So the speculative thought experiment of, uh, of Professor Coe's argument has done that for me. It acknowledges the complexity of the question it raises and thus opens the door for much thinking that necessarily follows that the paper itself does not yet do. Finally, and briefly, uh, as to the constructive call, both implicit and explicit, to think outside of our ontological assumptions, to seek for some critical distance on the invisible presuppositions that shape our civic lives, and to open our frames of reference to otherwise possibilities of different worldviews. Here, the constructive call, I think, is well taken. By showing us the unmistakable legal consequences of univitalist thinking, that is the diagnostic piece, the paper has reminded us 
of the blind spots that come with our preconceptions and thus unmistakably admonishes us to increase our critical awareness and our cultural capaciousness in the pursuit of a healthier planet and a more just and peaceful world. I certainly appreciate the thinking it has sparked and the conversation that it, that it has begun. Let me just conclude with one, um, with one question. This, in keeping with uh, the kind of central issue that the thought experiment raised for me about epistemology, is there is a kind of um, late motif of counterfactualism in the paper, the sort of what if, what if things were different, what if things had been different. And historians are sort of uh, reflexively troubled by counterfactuals uh, because they're so difficult to establish. It is difficult to say, what if Locke had had a multivitalist position? We simply have no way to empirically establish what the results of that would have been. I think the same thing is true in the contemporary conversation. What if we made room for multivitalism uh, that does not now exist? What would be the result? So the question is, in, a, in an effort that rests so much on counterfactual reasoning, how do you foresee the kind of process of uh, establishing the kind of intellectual um, proofs for the uh, assertions that you're making or the, the suggestions that you're presenting? What is that next step to move beyond the counterfactual to something that might be uh, established by empirical evidence? And is there any plan for that in your piece? So I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Professor Holland. Uh, Professor Coe has even more things to think about than he already did from Professor Hallisey's presentation and uh, really rich. And uh, we only have uh, 15 minutes left. And so I would like, you know, I would give you again, um, Professor Ko, a, a bit of a chance to just reflect publicly on what, you know, some of your thoughts, having heard Professor Holland. I do want to have, uh, I want to do want to at least leave about five minutes at the end. There's actually only a single question that has come up from the audience, but it was raised by two different people. And I just want to uh, uh, summarize that for you and, and, and let you give a very uh, quick response to that. But go ahead now um, with response to Dave, David Holland. Thank you so much, Professor Holland, for these comments. And uh, I completely agree with your very uh, lucid and actually very clarifying for me a kind of breakdown of the three parts of the paper and helping me to really um, put a lot more structure, conceptual structure around some of these impulses and thoughts that I've had that are very much outside of my academic discipline and, and really helping me to focus on the kind of diagnostic thought experiment and uh, attention to the kind of uh, prescriptive epistemological uh, questions moving forward are, are very helpful. In particular, some of the scholars that you've suggested and, and even this idea of Lockean epistemology. Yes, I, I am very in, intrigued by a lot of these epistemological questions. And I, I didn't realize that Locke had that uh, element to his paper, uh, to, to, not, not to his paper, but to his uh, thinking. Uh, with regard to, and I think that does overlap with the, with the kind of counterfactual element and the question that you introduced at the end, how does one show uh, the kind of function of this if we, because we do not live in a world where Locke had a different set of ontological commitments, for example, and therefore our legal system and, and culture emerged in the way that it did. I've been trying to approach this from different ways, and this is something I, on the, the legal side I've been talking with some of my uh, friends about. For uh, friends and colleagues uh, at my law school and others, uh, where are the spaces, for example, in which univitalism uh, plays a role in argument, for example, in the public discourse, for example, not just in judicial opinions, but in uh, rhetoric by uh, legislative policymakers, by executive branch uh, leaders. Of course, to some degree, public rhetoric is an imperfect proxy for deeper values. Uh, in, in American legal scholarship, there's a school of legal realism, which actually stands for the proposition that judges and other actors have internal dispositions uh, that they then ex post facto rationalize based on uh, reasons that they, that they uh, after the fact, come up with in order to justify their kind of deeper seated uh, intuitions as, as to what the proper legal outcome should be. And nonetheless, I think it could be intriguing, perhaps, to look at the way in which some of those debates have played out in the executive branch and the legislative branch, and especially in the judiciary. 
to show maybe spaces where a univitalist argument has made a material difference. And perhaps there's an argument to be made there that had a different set of uh, arguments arisen with regard to a more multivitalist approach, perhaps some of these uh, disputes would have resolved in another way. As you point out at the beginning of your comments, perhaps that's too difficult to tease out. And it's, it is very difficult to prove the counterfactual. It's very difficult to prove something that is so much, uh, very much embedded in what's around us, rendering the invisible visible. But I'm, I'm very grateful for your comments. Thank you so much. And it was very clarifying for me. Thank you. Thank you. Let me pose the, the, the question that uh, came from the audience. And then if we still have time, uh, we might have a, another uh, chance for our two respondents to maybe respond back to you in terms of what your, some of your comments and take the conversation even further. Two people in the audience were asking the question of uh, when you characterize the so-called Abrahamic traditions as being univitalists, are you taking into account the afterlife that is a widespread belief? So in, in other words, what's the, is, is, what's the major distinction between multi, you know, many lives and having an afterlife in which you are carrying some of the memories or traces or some, something of the Im impact I presume they're referring to you either go to heaven or hell, but one, one, one way or another, it's not actually only a single life in those religious traditions. Yes, I'm, uh, thank you, Professor Gatz. And I'm also just reading the questions which I hadn't seen before in the comments here. Yeah. Right, so I think, you know, this is a question that uh, one of my colleagues asked me as well is, is there something fruitful about combining, again, however we may refer to it, but some, some perhaps Abrahamic or Judeo-Christian conception of one life followed by an afterlife and a multivitalist conception uh, in which there is a kind of continuous rebirth. Is there, is there something fruitful about grouping um, those schools of thought and contrasting with, with perhaps others? And I think there is, uh, there are, there, and I think many scholars have written on this. I was uh, just doing some research on this recently is what is the function to some degree of beliefs in the afterlife versus not when it comes to criminal punishment? Um, there is a lot more, more legal rhetoric around, well, uh, we may have a certain punishment in this life, but then our creator will impose what he thinks is just uh, in the afterlife. Uh, and that's, that, that rhetoric has existed in the Western tradition uh, for a long time and arguably uh, influence the way in which law has developed uh, over time. I'm not familiar as much with um, the kind of multivitalist conception, but it is conceivable that there is some similarities between the two in, way, in the ways in which this, uh, this has emerged. I think what, what I find productive, again, from a thought experiment perspective, in the same way that John Rawls's Veil of Ignorance is a, is a thoughtful, kind of, is a helpful thought experiment is to say, um, I, I think a, a meaningful distinction is that multivitalism really puts emphasis on this earth and on the here and now. And yes, there may be distinctions uh, you know, coming from certain uh, 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 other religious multivitalist traditions on the role of karma and, and who is reborn where, when, et cetera, et cetera. But the returning, the, the central idea to some degree is return to this earth. Whereas in a uh, univitalist religious conception, uh, this particular earth is, is no longer a piece. I think that's why it has potential for, again, for environmental questions, criminal justice questions, tax policy questions, distributional justice questions. Okay, thanks. Uh, so let me then throw the floor open to our two respondents who might want to say a few more words based on how you responded to their responses. And we can uh, continue this conversation, fascinating conversation and the many issues that have just come up. Um, so Professor Halsey, do you want to say anything more in response to Professor Koh? I'd like to just say one thing in response to both Professor Holland and Professor Koh. And I, I just wonder whether a comparative study of law in uh, multivitalist majority communities in which we don't see uh, the concern uh, for the reality of multivitalism for legal decision-making might put into question the idea that the focus on this life 
uh, one life is coming from an ontology that uh, comes from Christianity or monotheistic religions, but that there might be some other kind of explanation of it, something like uh, the anthropologist Robin Horton's uh, idea of a primary theory that is relatively shared across cultures, whereas secondary theories are radically incompatible with each other. It's it's interesting, Charlie. I mean, again, I think I think the, the instinct for both of us is to 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 take the step beyond the thought experiment and start engaging in the kind of empirical evidence that might put flesh on the bone here. Uh, and, uh, and and to your point, it might even change the very sort of conceptual framework in which we're thinking about these differences. Uh, were we to do so, I I. Um, perhaps ironically or inconsistently, <laughs> I, I, I've got a question in my mind that uh, invites even more speculation, um, which is, I, I was struck, Professor Ko, in, uh, in your statistics about the plurality of Americans who are, if not committed to, at least open to multivitalist ways of thinking about life and death and birth. And I'm wondering if given the, the strength of that uh, demographic statistic, why the univitalist has remained so unchallenged in a, in a national community where the numbers seem to be shifting against it. Do you have any thoughts about that and what, what it takes for those numbers to begin to be reflected in the kind of spaces that you're identifying as dominated by univitalist thinking? Professor Gasser, should I respond briefly? Or, yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, great. Yeah. So, 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 thank you both for for your for your continued thoughts, Professor Halsey. I I would say yeah, I think this is a very that that's a very helpful way of thinking through. Um, I I guess both comments are very well taken because they're both getting at this idea of how can we really know the function of this uh, in in our contemporary legal system. Uh, I, I would say two things with regard to the distinction between primary and secondary theory. This is a source of a lot of debate uh, within legal scholarship because legal scholarship is not a, a singular uh, field of study and a singular methodology. So we have a, a tremendous plurality of methodologies in legal scholarship. And so what is the kind of primary theory for law and criminal punishment? Some people have a critical race perspective on that. Some people have a uh, law and economics perspective on that. Um, uh, the, the, your political economy questions. Uh, there's a there's a variety of methodologies, and so it's it. I, I guess perhaps that is another reason why I'm I'm, in, I'm intrigued in this as a thought experiment to kind of see applying this particular theoretical lens what may emerge in a kind of neo pragmatist sort of way. But it is intriguing to kind of think through uh, where the cross cultural similarities may be, uh, and it is possible that that regardless of the thought experiment, putting the thought experiment to the side, really the best predictor, perhaps empirically, with a broad statistical analysis of the degree to which societies punish is, for example, an economic question. I mean, it's very, it's very intriguing to think about this, or maybe something about the nature of the state vis-a-vis -vis individual uh, liberties. Uh, and, and Professor Holland, uh, my answer to you as to why with rising multivitalism, uh, our legal system is so univitalist, is that law is a very conservative institution. Uh, and I mean that not necessarily in a political way, uh, but more in terms of, by definition, laws are very slow moving and judges are bound by precedents. So uh, sometimes we see very rapid uh, developments in law as uh, spawned by, for example, the, the murder of George Floyd uh, has led to a lot of very rapid legal developments in policing, uh, but other developments have been very slow to uh, emerge because especially nowadays, legislators are very low to pass new legislation and judges are to some degree constrained by a prior precedent. So having said that over time, cultural change does lead to a shift in law. And again, the, the example being, for example, cannabis legality or the right to gay marriage as cultural norms uh, move in new directions to some degree through the political process, um, uh, judges and legislators and executive branch officials will 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 operate under different uh, beliefs, and we might push even further to say operate under different ontological 
uh, kind of assumptions about the nature of everything, maybe even at the extreme, the nature of, of life and death. So if, if I might, that raises a, another interesting question for me in, in regard to the the structure uh, and the the implication of the paper, um, which is that we've sort of conflated, at least I have in my reading of it, and and I need to go back to to see if that's a, a fair reading of it or not. But in my in my reading of it, in my comments, even I've conflated uh, the legislative implications of this and the interpretive implications of this, right? The both, you know, that that there's a univitalist assumption in the way laws are written and a univitalist assumption in the way laws are applied, interpreted and applied. Uh, and, and your response there um, raises a question about, sorry, they're doing a little construction next door, um, raises a question about uh, whether it, these questions about univitalism and multivitalism apply equally in both spaces, um, or is it more important to have that sort of cultural capaciousness in the way a law is written? Is it unrealistic to think that necessarily it's going to filter into questions of application or sentencing, or do you see these things as sort of equally susceptible to the kinds of conceptual expansion that you're talking about so I'm, I'm just going to intervene here i'll be like the uh news host that we watch every night when when they tell someone that you have 30 seconds to answer that question thank you professor holland i'd, I'd say three things one is i think all three branches are equally vulnerable or or equally exhibiting the univitalist assumption uh two uh legal scholars have a disproportionate focus on the judiciary because of our legal training uh, but three, what I'm hoping to do with my research in, in looking at this kind of public rhetoric is to kind of see if there is a disproportionate expression of this assumption in different uh, legal moments, whether it's executive branch, uh, the legislative or the judiciary. Thanks. Thank to uh, Professor Coe for such a uh, provocative and interesting paper and the work that you're doing and for really excellent uh, responses from both Professor Hallisey and Professor Holland. So this is really, for me at least, it was an extremely satisfying event. And I want to thank in particular Diane Moore for taking this whole project up and organizing it and her uh, Religion and Public Life program and Judy Beals for your very, very helpful support. And also to Navidra as well. Thank you so much to everyone and uh, wishing everybody a good weekend and um, lots of stuff to think about for the future. Sponsors, Religion and Public Life, Office of Academic Affairs at HDS. Copyright 2022, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.